Well, good morning, everybody. Isn't it nice to have air conditioning back? <laughs> I know for me, I am an awkward sweater. I'm just going to be honest. I sweat awkwardly. That's what I should say. And uh, so it's nice to finally have air back. And, uh, and how many of you thought that was a little bit too much information to know? A little bit? All right, do me a favor. Um, grab a Bible or electronic device if you have one. I'm going to give you two passages of Scripture that you can turn to. And uh, the first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the other would be Ephesians 6. So 2 Corinthians 10, Ephesians 6. Um, if you're a guest, my name is Matthew Johnson, I'm the lead pastor, and just so honored you're with us today. And, and for all of you, one of the things that's, um, you, you might not know this, but uh, I plan out the sermon series, I'm typically about a year out in advance, so I know for the next year or more what I'm going to be teaching. And the reason that I do that is because I want to take time to be able to pray over the different topics and study them. Also, it allows me, uh, as I assign other pastors to different weeks and different topics, it allows me to give them a heads up so that they can prepare accordingly. Uh, but this past year was somewhat unique in that we got delayed because of our building, and so they pushed our back our teaching schedule because there was a specific series that I wanted to launch in our new building. And so it, it gave me a few open weeks, which I was actually really excited about, but as a result of that, I just took some time and I was praying about it to see if I felt like there was some topic that God specifically wanted me to talk about with our church. And one of the topics, the topic that I'm going to be speaking on for the next few weeks is I'm going to talk about relationships. And the reason that this is so important to me is that first of all, for us as a church, it is extremely important to us. Our vision or mission statement, however you want to word it, is this, we, to make disciples of Jesus Christ through purposed relationships and relevant environments. It's a simple statement, but it helps guide us in, in our value system. And, and in that, we want people to be in relationships. So we work very hard as a church to get you connected relationally. We work very hard for you to have healthy relationships. It's something that we spend a ton of energy and resources toward. We want marriages to be healthy. We want parent-child relationships to be healthy. We want reconciliation where there's broken relationships. So not only is it a value of our church, but I think anyone that knows me knows it's one of my greatest values. It is something that I think about, I pray about. I want us to have healthy relationships. And, and as I think about relationships, there are some truths about relationships that I think if I were to ask you to nod your head and if you agreed, I, I think we would have almost a unanimous response to uh, truths like this. Relationships are important. And I don't think anyone goes like, no, relationships are important. If you, if you do, then there's a good chance at some point you were really wounded in your past. But I think most people recognize, yeah, relationships are important. Uh, we were designed by God to desire and need relationships, but also to value them. When you're in a healthy relationship, it, there are few things that can bring you more joy and satisfaction than having a healthy relationship. So I think we all understand they're important. But then there's this other truth that is, it's weird because it's almost ironic. It almost seems like a contradiction in that in one sense, relationships are such great value to us. But then there's this truth. Relationships are hard, right? I mean, and they're difficult. And, and what's ironic about it is the relationship that can bring you the most joy still requires work. And, and that's something that, I mean, like for me, my greatest relationship, the one that brings me the most joy in my life is my relationship with my wife, Mary. Um, this past week, a perfect example, we were able to get away. Uh, this past Wednesday, my wife celebrated her 40th birthday, and, uh, and I know that it's crazy for you that know her because she looks like she's 20, but um, it, so we were able to get away and go to New York, or New York, Chicago, one of the big cities. We went to Chicago uh, for a few days. Uh, we we're able to spend the time together, and for me, and I literally mean this, I could spend 24-7 with Mary. I never get tired of hanging out with her. And I actually said it to her this week, and I go, does that make me clingy? <laughs> and she was like, no, you know, I'm the same way. And, and so this relationship with Mary that brings me the most joy, what I look forward to the most, the reality of that relationship is it's still hard, and it still requires work. And the reason it requires work is there's still two individuals in it, two people who have their own preferences Two people who have their own selfishness and their own desires. Two people that are broken by sin. And, and so there's always going to be conflict that we have to work through in that relationship. And we know this. Every relationship in our lives, given enough time, is going to require work because they're, they're hard. And so what happens in our relationships is that we put this work toward it. Sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. 
And I'm seeing a rhythm that I think is very unhealthy in our culture, and it's this. I think we're giving up on relationships too quickly. I think we are very much a consumeristic culture that puts us as the customer, and so in our mindset, everywhere we go, we're the customer. So if I go to a restaurant and I don't like it, I quit going to that restaurant. If, if I go to a mechanic and I don't like what he, he or she did, then I quit going to that mechanic. If, if whatever it is, if I don't like it, I quit it, and even in relationships, if a relationship in my life is not something that I find value in or joy in anymore, then I quit it. But, but instead of just simply saying it's our fault, though I think it is, but I think that's too simple of it to say. I think the real problem, and this is what I want to talk about today, so if you're on the defensive, just relax for a second, okay? What I think the real issue is, is that we are fighting for relationships. I just think we're fighting the wrong way. I think in our minds, we want healthy relationships. I've yet to meet the person who strives for unhealthy relationships. People do unhealthy things, but I've yet to find the person that's like, you know what? I would just love all my relationships to be unhealthy. (laughs) That would make me happy. That person would be sick, right? Instead, what I see is people genuine wanting healthy relationships, but the problem is we're fighting for them in the wrong way. And and when I say the wrong way, here's what I want you to say. I kind of want to shape it this way. I'm not talking about a subtle tweak. I'm not talking about in our relationships, the way that we're doing it, if we just modify it a little bit, then that's the right way. I'm talking about a completely different game. Like, Like in my mind, as I think about how we're fighting for relationships, it's comparable to someone having a basketball game and you showing up carrying a football. Like you're in the wrong sport. You're doing the wrong thing. It, it would be like if you go to the doctors and the doctor tells you you have this massive infection inside your body, and so you go, okay, I'll take a Tylenol. Like it, it might handle some of the symptoms, but you're not really fighting the fight. A completely different game, a, a different mindset. And, and what we're going to look at today is a story through a man named Paul who chose to fight for relationships in a way that's dramatically different than anything else the world had ever heard before. The words of Paul are so dramatic that if you take them and apply them to your life, hear me on this, it really will be the game changer. It will change the health and rhythm of every single relationship in your life. And so I want to take his story and I want to use it today to encourage us and to challenge us because, again, my hope is that all of us have healthy relationships in our lives. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Paul, and then we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So Paul was, he was raised in a very religious home. He was a Jew, so he was raised in the religion, the concept of Judaism. And Paul wasn't just simply a follower of Judaism. He was the best of the best. He was raised in a highly strict home. He became a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a religious leader that not only mastered the law of God, but also was a teacher of the law of God. And so even as Paul's own words, as he describes his previous life where he was a Pharisee, he says, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Like, I was the best of the best. I was elite. I was so strict in the way that I followed it that few could surpass me in that. And, uh, and so Paul, in that passion to please God and to serve God, actually made a mistake. He did not see Jesus as the Son of God or being God. So in Paul's perspective, what Jesus was doing was launching a false religion that actually competed with what God wanted to do. So Paul, in his misplaced passion, actually resisted the church. And when I say resisted, I'm not talking about like spoke out against it and and was protesting. He was having Christians arrested and killed. So Paul was there when Stephen was stoned to death, and it said he was standing there holding the jackets of those who were stoning him, and he was giving approval. So Paul, his passion was to to wipe out Christianity. So he would go from city to city and have Christians arrested and or killed. So one day, Paul seeks permission from the religious leaders to go to a different city, Damascus, and there try to search out and find any Christians to have them arrested. So he had permission to do this. And so again, in Paul's perspective, at this point, Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. He's in heaven. From Paul's perspective, Jesus is a, is a false teacher, or was a false teacher, and this is a false religion. So he is heading to Damascus, and he has this supernatural experience that changes his life. He meets the resurrected Jesus. Jesus actually knocks him off of his horse, <laughs> which is pretty dramatic, and then speaks to him and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul has this supernatural, radical transformation where he goes from the greatest persecutor of the church to the greatest missionary, quite possibly that has ever lived. Paul would go around that entire region and start churches in the name of Jesus Christ. 
He would start churches, raise up leaders, empower them to be pastors, and he would go to the next city. This whole time, as he traveled from city to city, developing churches, raising up leaders, he would also write letters to them, encouraging them in areas of faith. And he would have these exchanges. So they would write him letters, and then he would respond back to them. So what we have in the scriptures is First and Second Corinthians. These were letters that he wrote to the church in Corinth, which is modern-day Greece. What's actually kind of ironic about it is, 1 Corinthians, the letter we have in the Bible, 1 Corinthians is the second letter he wrote. We don't have the first. And 2 Corinthians is actually the fourth letter. And we know that from context because he's responding to things he previously wrote them, and he's responding to things that they sent him. So Paul was this incredible man of God. But unfortunately for Paul, he also faced criticism. And here's just a reality of life. If you are a leader, you will face criticism. I am a leader. I face criticism. It's a reality of leadership. Some will like what you do. Some will not. Those that don't will oftentimes speak out against it and criticize. So Paul was facing criticism, and I would even say harsh criticism, ungodly criticism. People were saying this about Paul. They were saying he's worldly. He's not really a Christian. He's sinful. They were, they were attacking the doctrine that he was teaching that Jesus gave him personally, and they were saying it's not of God. They were actually making fun of Paul physically, the way that he looked, the way that he would speak. And, and so he faced all this persecution. So Paul, in response to this, and I want you to think about this, in response to that, if there was ever a person who could have crushed his opposition, it was Paul. Paul was not only right, but Paul was also in a position of authority. Paul was brilliant in the way that he thought and the way that he wrote. He could have written a letter and absolutely annihilated these people. He could have called them out by name, spoke out against them, rebuked them, and quite possibly, if he did that, it would go down in history. Their names would be known for the sin of their lives in our Bibles. How would you like to be that person, right? And, but yet Paul, instead of doing it that way, chose to fight for the relationship in a dramatically different way. And what Paul does, again, is so unique that up until this point, it had never been thought of to treat a relationship this way. And this is the game changer. This is the one that if you will do in your relationships will radically change the health of your relationships. So let's look at it. In verse 1 of chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. So when we stop here, Paul is about to say, he goes, here's how I want to address you. I want to address you in, in meekness and gentleness. We'll come back to that in a moment. But then he makes a statement, which on the surface sounds like he's kind of almost bragging about himself. He says, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. What he's actually doing in this moment is he is quoting an insult that they were hurling at him. It's, a, it's something else that he explains down in verse 10 of the same chapter. And he quotes it and he says this. For they say, this is what the, the people were saying about him. His letters, so in the New Testament, what we have, the epistles, are letters that Paul wrote out. So his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Ouch. That stings a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, do you guys get what they just said about Paul? They're like... Paul. Yeah, I mean, his letters that he writes, I mean, they're dramatic. They're bold and they're, they're dynamic. But have you seen him? He's puny. He's a horrible preacher. He's not good at teaching. I mean, this is literally what they're saying. But how, would, how should or would you respond if you were Paul? See, like, in my perspective is, like, I know how I would respond. Let me say it this way. I know how I would be tempted to respond. And how I'd be tempted to respond is to blast these people, to say, how dare you speak out against me, and, and how dare you, God has called me to do these things, and I'm just trying to do my best. And, and so Paul instead, going, going back to verse 1, Paul says, here's how I'm going to approach this. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Paul goes, I want to resolve this tension that we have in the relationship. You're mad at me, you're insulting me, you don't respect me. I want to reconcile this, but instead of blasting you, I'm going to do this differently. I want to have meekness and gentleness, but here's the reason why. I want to be like Christ. So what Paul is saying is the method of Paul is going to be the method of Christ. And I want you to think about what Paul is saying here. Paul had his own rhythm. 
Paul had his own way, I'm sure that he wanted to respond. Paul is brilliant in his way of thinking. He could have absolutely destroyed them, but Paul goes, here's what I want to do. I want to do something different. I want to do it the way of Christ. So Paul's method was going to be Christ's method. So here's a question I have for us. What's the method of blank? And I want you to fill in the blank with your name. So for me, what, what is the method of Matthew? So let's, let's do a, a quick exercise. When I read this question and point at you, I want you to say your name out loud. What's the method of how do you approach conflict in a relationship? If you have tension with your spouse, with your boyfriend, girlfriend, if you have tension with your children, with a coworker, if you have tension with a family member, if you have tension with strangers, what's your method? How do you respond to that tension? Whether good or bad, I'm not, I'm not even criticizing, I'm just saying, what's your rhythm? Paul is about to explain a completely different way of handling it. He, he's saying, I don't want to handle my rhythm, I know how that ends up, I want to do this the way that Christ has called us to do. So he goes on, and, and today as we talk about these truths, I want you to think about the tension in your life. Paul in verse 2 says, so I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So when, when Paul is saying this, some people were saying about Paul that him and his followers, that they're walking according to the flesh, which is that they're sinful, they're carnal. And, and this is a huge accusation because Paul is trying to plant churches and tell people about Jesus if you can undermine him and tell people, oh, he's a phony, he's a fake, then people won't listen to him and the kingdom of God will suffer. So Paul has some urgency to address this. And he's saying, instead of having to come there and really to put you in your place, he's like, I'm, I'm begging you that you have a different heart and a different response to this. And so Paul is then going to explain how he fights for the relationship. And over the next four verses, and again, hear me, if you will do these things in your relationship, I promise you it will make a difference. Here's what Paul says in verse 3. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So Paul immediately does like a play on words. They accused him of walking in the flesh, being worldly or carnal, and he changes it and says, okay, though we walk in the flesh, and he's just saying simply, we walk in the physical. So we're just physical beings. We have bodies and minds, and we respond in the physical. Paul goes, though we walk in the physical, we are not waging war according to the flesh. And he's talking about relational tension. He goes, we're not fighting according to the physical. Okay, okay so stop this. If you're a Christian, you probably have heard this language before, so it seems familiar. But I want you to imagine this moment, because this is the first time it was ever said like this. Paul goes, though we are physical beings, that's not how we fight in relationships. We don't fight in the physical. Wait, what? Like, if you're in that audience, you're like, what do you mean you don't fight in the physical? That's, that's how we fight. That's the only way to fight. Everyone here, think about it. When you have tension in a relationship, what do you do? You fight in the physical. You think the solution to your problem is you have to find a physical solution. If you're mad at your spouse, you want your spouse to change something physically, and then you'll be happy. If you're mad at your children, you want your children to change physical behavior, and then you'll be happy. If you're mad at your parents, you want your parents to change physical behavior, and then you'll be happy. It's in every single relationship, the dynamic is, we're going to discuss, we're going to argue, we're going to fight for our rights, we're going to have this rhythm where I'm going to, I'm going to argue for myself, you're going to argue for yourself, one of us is going to try to prove right, like maybe one of us will be right and then we'll, we'll do that, or maybe we'll both kind of be right and so we'll compromise, but in our minds, we think the solution is physical, and Paul's like, no. There's a whole nother reality going on that, that, we, that we choose to implement in our relationships. And so the audience would have been like, what? What are you talking about? So Paul goes on and starts to explain. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, are not physical, but have divine or spiritual power to destroy strongholds. So Paul says, here's how we fight. We don't fight in the physical, we fight 
first in the spiritual. And the audience would have been like, what? What what do you mean by that? I mean, how does that practically look? And, And for us in the church world, when we start talking about the spiritual realm, here's what I have to acknowledge. I know for some, it seems goofy. For some, it seems fake. It seems like old superstition. And the reason is, is we live in the Western culture. If you don't know this, the vast majority of the world still absolutely believes in the spiritual realm. But in our culture, we have gotten to a place where if we can't quantify something, if we can't explain something, if we can't prove something in a physical reality, then we disregard it. We, we make fun of it. We reject it. But the reality for us, especially for us the people of faith, is there is a spiritual world, a spiritual realm going on. And if you believe in God, you have to believe in the spiritual. Jesus, who is God, said this when he was here on earth. He says, our God is a spirit. And those who want to worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. Jesus says, God is a spirit. Our God that we worship and connect to is in the spiritual realm. This same Jesus, who is God, also confirmed the reality that there is a demonic spiritual realm that resists us in our lives. If you don't know this, there was an angel created whose name was Satan, and Satan rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven. He convinced a third of the angels to follow him, and they have set themselves up in opposition to whatever it is that God wants to accomplish. So in the spiritual realm, God is working on our behalf and for us, and there are spiritual forces that are working against us. Jesus said it this way, the thief, referring to Satan, comes only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest or abundantly. So what we recognize is God wants to bless us and guide us in our lives. Satan wants to resist us. So where we have attention is, my experience is, most of us are quick to acknowledge the the good spiritual side of it. Like like there's a part of us that goes like, yeah, I I believe God's on my side. I, I believe God gives me wisdom. I believe God gives me peace. I believe God touches my heart. Like we, f- we feel his presence. And so there's a part of us that goes, yeah, I want to recognize the good side of spiritual. But when we talk about the other side, that seems silly. Like you talk about Satan. I mean, is, is he the dude with like the horns and the red outfit and the tail and the pitchfork? And it's like, no, I mean, that's a caricature. It's a joke of our culture. Satan is a very real spiritual force that is fighting against us. Now, just to be clear, he's not God's equal force. He's a created being that can be uncreated, but there is a resistance in our lives. And so what Paul is saying is, in this spiritual reality, we have to choose to fight using spiritual weapons. And so Paul, in Ephesians 6, says it this way. The same guy, writing to the church in Ephesus, says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What he's saying is the same way that God has plans for your life, the schemes are Satan's strategic plans for your life to destroy you so that we can fight against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul's explanation of this is there is a spiritual reality. Now, here's what I can say to you. It's your right to say, I don't believe in that. I mean, you can choose to believe whatever you want, but it's going to be to your own hurt. Our God is saying that there is a spiritual realm that's resisting, and if we don't choose to acknowledge it and fight in the spiritual, we will always be losing the battle. And Paul goes on and says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. And then Paul goes on and starts to list all of the spiritual weapons that are at our disposal. I don't have time to teach all of them, but I'll give you the list. Things like truth, righteousness, that means being in right standing with God, the gospel of peace, the good news that we're saved by what Jesus did for us on the cross, having faith in God, salvation, the word of God, which is the Bible, praying in the spirit, which I believe is tongues, and then prayer. Paul says all of these things that God has given us, we need to use in our relationships in order to be victorious. And I just can summarize it this way. Here's what you need. You need the presence of God in your life and in your relationships. See, what happens is we're so tempted to immediately go to the physical. 
My kid needs to change their behavior. My spouse needs to change their behavior. My coworker needs to change their behavior. And we go immediately to the physical. But the problem is, is if there is a spiritual reality going on and we never address that, we don't address what really our problem is. Think about it. Your spouse, who you're frustrated with their behavior, what if they're under spiritual attack? What if something is bothering them? Something is messing with their mood. Something is distorting their way of thinking. In your mind, you're picturing they're totally rational and just choosing to act that way. But what if there is something really hurting and oppressing them? I'll tell you, friends, if, if you don't recognize this, I'll tell you from personal experience, spiritual warfare is real. I, I have had times in my life where I have no logical explanation that, but just to say I am struggling with my emotions, I am struggling with how I'm feeling, and here's what I recognize. I'm mature enough now in my faith to recognize there are spiritual forces attacking me. And my wife, I'm so thankful for a godly wife, there are times that she'll say to me, what's going on? Like, I can just sense something's wrong, and, and she knows it's not her. And I'll, I'll say to her, spiritual warfare. I'm just oppressed. And there are times that she'll lay hands on me and pray for me. And, and, and in a relationship, if your response is not to invite the presence of God into it, you are missing the first critical step. And so Paul says, you have to be willing to bring the presence of God into your situation. Why? The presence of God changes everything. One of my absolute favorite psalms is Psalm 73. I've taught it numerous times here at the retreat. In Psalm 73, it's the story of a worship leader named Asaph. He worked under the ministry of King David. And Asaph, he, he talks about this internal turmoil that he had. The, the book begins, he says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my foot almost slipped. He, he said, I almost, he's a, he's a follower of God. He says, I almost fell away from God. And he explains why. He says, it was when I looked and saw the prosperity of the wicked. Like he could not understand these people are not in a relationship with God. They're not serving God. Their lives look easy. They look prosperous. And he says, this was so oppressive to me that I almost fell away from God. And he even says this. I mean, I, I relate to it as a pastor. He says, if I would have actually spoken out loud what I was feeling, I would have led other men and women away from God. And so I stayed silent. And so it just, it tormented him. And then in the middle of this psalm, he says the solution. He goes, until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then it all became clear to me. What he's saying is, until I entered the presence of God, and then I realized the reality. And when we enter into the presence of God, God starts to bring clarity into our situation. He starts to change the way that we think. He starts to guide us in a new direction. He starts to empower us in our lives. He starts to defend our hearts, and he starts to fight for those that we're praying for. And this is what Paul says. This is where we begin. We don't begin in the physical because our battle's not in the physical. We begin in the spiritual. And so my question for you as you think about your rhythm, as I asked a question earlier, what's the method of fill in the blank? As you think about your rhythm, does the spiritual ever enter into the equation? How often do you bring prayer, studying of the word of God, worship into your relational turmoil and tension? Or do you just simply go to the physical? Because Paul says we have to begin in the spiritual. Why? Because it leads us to this next part, verse 5. Paul goes on and says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I mean, this is dramatic language. I want to read it again. He says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Uh, now, note, note this. What is Paul not destroying? <laughs> Paul's not saying, I destroy people, right? He's not even saying, I destroy their argument. He's not saying, like, anyone that comes against me, I, Paul, bring him to the end. I destroy them. That's not as hard at all. He's saying, I destroy anything that opposes the rhythm of God. I oppose anything that challenges the truth of what God wants us to do. You note this. Paul doesn't say, I hang out in this false ideas. I hang out in this sinful way of thinking. Because in our lives, the rhythm that all of us have is we naturally think about what is selfish. We naturally think about our own rhythms of what we desire. And I want to say something. This is like really harsh and really bold. So I just need you to give me grace. But for some of you, you have friends that give you the worst advice possible. I, I, and the reason I know it is because I've heard it. 
you'll tell me, oh, I, was, I was talking to my family, I was talking to my friends, and they told me this is what I'm supposed to do, and I'm like, that's awful advice. I mean, people are like, yeah, my friend told me I just had to, should just tell my spouse off. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, here, here's a simple way to think about this. Can you picture that advice coming out of the mouth of Jesus? Can you picture Jesus going, my child, tell your spouse off, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Obviously, I'm being, I mean, a smart dog, but you, no, you can't picture that harsh advice coming out of the mouth of Jesus. If you can't picture and see it found in the word of God, Jesus speaking that to you, it is something that is setting itself up against the knowledge of God. It, it's a thought that you need to take captive and make it surrender to the obedience to Christ and what he wants for your life. And, and when you see this where it says, take thoughts captive, that word for thoughts in the Greek actually most often is translated mind. So it's not just one thought, though it includes a thought. It's a way of thinking. And Paul is saying, when we are going to enter into the presence of God and invite him into our lives, he is going to lead us away from our natural rhythm. He's going to lead us away from the horrible advice that we receive. And he's going to lead us to tear down strongholds, to destroy thoughts set, up, thoughts set up against God, to take them captive. And you go, okay, but how does he do that? One simple word, truth. God in his presence is going to lead us into truth. Now, now I have to pause for a second, because some of you might hear this and you might go, yes, yes, this is what I'm talking about, Matt. I'm all about truth. I'm all about the facts. I love sitting down and going over the facts, and, and I love things that are black and white, and this is, this is how I think. But I want to give you some, some guidance in this. Here's the first part. Facts alone are an incomplete version of truth. So let me explain this in a moment. I want to say it again. Facts alone are an incomplete version of truth. You, you might think, I, I know the facts. They did this behavior. They did this. We had this discussion. They made this promise. They didn't do it. That's the facts. That's still an incomplete picture of truth. Here's what truth is. Truth is the facts processed through the lens of God's love. And I'm telling you, that line right there can change some of your lives. Truth is the facts processed through the lens of God's love. Because you can look at facts and you can absolutely miss the truth of God. Let me give you a, a real example that's happened in my own life at times. I've had people that have really said some evil things against me. Things that are 100% untrue. So I know I am I'm broken by sin. I don't make always the best decisions. I've made mistakes. So I'm not saying I'm perfect. I know I'm not perfect. But there have been situations where people have absolutely made up lies about me and spoken ill of me, gossiped about me. That's the fact of the situation. They did that. And if I stopped there, I could stop at the facts and go, I'm right, they're wrong, boom. I, I could destroy them. I could fight back. I can get you know on my high horse. But when I go to God and I say, God, Help me view this in the right way. You know what God starts to show me that is bigger than just the facts of the situation? God shows me that I'm still called to love them. I'm still called to pray for them. And what God has actually shown me, and this is a new rhythm in my life, is that God has shown me that sometimes people have been hurt really bad in their life. And, and for whatever reason, they project onto me some of those past hurts that other people have done in their lives. It's, sometimes it's just people in authority. It's, it's parents previous bosses, it's, it's former teachers, whatever it might be. And so I represent authority, and so they project it on me, and, and God has shown me that, and it has really softened my heart to be a heart of compassion toward them. The facts were an incomplete picture. The truth of God's love, as I view what has happened through what God has led me to, to see, all of a sudden the truth is a more complete picture. And even Mary and I, in our, in our relationship now, one of the rhythms that we've had is, is in our lives, and these are relationships that have to do with the church and friendships and family and, and other, uh, other relationships. If we ever have tension now with a relationship, Mary and I both pray the same thing. We go to God and we ask God to give us compassion for the people who have sinned against us. Give us compassion for those that we're in a, in a tense relationship with. And you know what God has done? I'm not exaggerating here. 100% of the time, God has given me compassion toward people that at one point I was angry against. And, and you know what happens? This, this isn't going to be good news to some of you. You know what happens? Sometimes I'm praying, and I think I'm right 100%, and God shows me that I'm wrong. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> I, it's so much more fun initially to be right, to think you're right, to be in that illusion. But what God will show me is he'll go, Matt, you know, you might be right overall. You might be right in the majority of it, but you could have done that differently. 
you could have responded that way. You could have acted that way. You could have thought that way. You could have said that. And, and God starts to, to change the perspective. And what God is doing is he's giving, you, giving me a more complete picture. This is actually what truth is. And my heart is softer and my love for them is real. And it allows me the opportunity to actually pursue reconciliation. See, if we don't have truth or we just have the facts, we'll never pursue reconciliation. And so what happens then is we have the presence of God. The presence of God leads us to truth. But then what we do with that truth matters. And Paul goes on and addresses that in verse 6. He says, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So Paul's like, we're still going to have to address if there's ongoing disobedience. But what we're going to focus on is making your obedience complete. We're, we're going to focus on God's presence leads us into truth, but this information, it, it's, it's limited still. It's, it's real, it's complete in that it's truth, but truth is truth no matter what, but it's only true to you when you obey. When, when you take truth and you apply it to your life in obedience, then it becomes real to you. So, so I need you to hear this, what I'm about to say. This, again, is another one of those things that if you get this into your heart, it can change you. Truth is not information. It's a life-altering revelation where, where God speaks to you and all of a sudden you go, I need to change. I need to do something differently. You have a perspective. My, this person is wrong. My child is wrong. My spouse is wrong. My coworker is wrong. My parents are wrong, whatever it might be. And then truth comes into your life and it alters your perspective and changes you. And all of a sudden you're like, I love them. My heart is soft toward them. I've done some things wrong, and I, I want to I fix it, and it changes your life. But it only becomes real to you when that truth gets applied to your life. See, Jesus says it this way. It's a, a scripture many of you are familiar with, John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, and the word abide means to live in, to dwell it's the idea that he's saying to them is if you take my word and you make it the reality of your life, you live in it, you obey, you live it out, okay? He says, if, conditional clause, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. You will not know the truth simply by information. You will really know the truth when it is revealed to you and you apply it to your life. When you apply it to your life, then it will become more real than just information in your head. And then what does Jesus say? Once it becomes real to you, and the truth will do what? Set you free. That is when you find freedom in your heart. That's when you start to experience reconciliation in your relationships. That's when life radically changes. And, and so for Paul, as he's wording this, he's going, okay, I have the high ground. I could come. I could blast you guys. I'm right. You're wrong. But here's what I'm going to do. This is Paul. He says, I'm going to fight in the spiritual. I'm going to invite the presence of God into the situation. And, and I'm going to suppress anything that sets itself up against God. I'm going to use truth to conquer lies. And then he says, but I'm not going to just stop there. I'm going to apply that truth to my life. And I want you to do the same. And every person that does this, what they'll experience is the freedom that comes from knowing the truth of God's word. So now I want to go back. Okay. What's your rhythm? When you have tension in your life, when you have tension in relationships, is it to run to the physical? Is it to gossip? Is it to argue? Is it to get frustrated? My guess is for all of us, we'll go, yeah, that's a rhythm. I'm your pastor. I would say, for the most part, I don't mean this arrogantly, but I would say for the most part, I'm a mature Christian. My rhythm still to this day is almost 100% of the time I initially run to the physical. It's easy, it's natural, it's how I think. I'm very intellectual, I like to communicate verbally. I wanna talk it through. This is something God is teaching me to stop and go, okay, God, I want, I want your presence. I want your guidance. I want you to give me compassion. I want you to soften my heart. I want you to show me where I'm wrong. Show me the things that need to change in my life. At times, it's incredibly freeing. At times, it's incredibly frustrating. At times, it's like God shows me stuff, and I think, I wish I would have never prayed. <laughs> uh, ignorance was so much more bliss, but yet God, through that, has led me to reconcile relationships. And right now in my life, I mean, if you want to pray for me, there are three relationships in my life that I want to reconcile. I pray every single day for it.
and believing in the word of God that God's going to help me reconcile those relationships. He's helped me in other relationships and I know he'll do it again. But right now, it seems like an impossible task. Right now, it hurts. My heart hurts. I think about it every day, almost all day long. But I believe the word of God. He has never failed me. He has never led me astray. And when I look at this, I think this is the hope that I have to pray. The physical has not worked. The spiritual has to work. And so in our lives, we have the simple question, do we want to keep doing it our way? I mean, how, how's that working out? Sometimes there's probably success. A lot of times it's probably it's not. How's that working out? Then we look at God's way and go, do I, am I willing to try something new? Am I willing to do something that is supernatural? Do I believe God loves me? Do I believe God is supernaturally going to move in my situation? And I believe when we do this, we're going to see radical change in our lives. And so I want to give you time right now to respond to this. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads, take a posture of prayer. And I want you to think about your relationship in your life. If there's any relationships that have tension, and I want you to invite God into that situation or those situations. I want you to take a moment. You don't have to be eloquent in your prayer. You don't even have to know the right words to say. Just invite God to God, will you move in this situation? Will you move in my heart? Will you move in their heart? Will you help them if they're under spiritual attack? Will you help me if I'm under spiritual attack? Just ask God to move in your situation and then be open. God might speak something specifically to you today. And we're just going to give you a few minutes. Michael, Pastor Michael is just going to play. And I just want you to, in this next few minutes, just to pray. I'm going to be silent and let you do so. And then we're going to respond in a time of worship. So go ahead and begin just to pray. I want to thank you for giving us the incredible privilege of inviting you into our situations. We're thankful for the promises of your word that describes you as a warrior that's willing to fight for your children. So Lord, I pray that you help us to remember that, that we will go to you first inviting you to change our minds and hearts, inviting you to protect our lives and our relationships. And Lord, I pray that as we respond to you, the truth that you reveal to us and we respond in obedience, I pray that our hearts will be open in faith to see you move in a mighty way. Lord, you know my heart, the deep passion of my life is to see healthy relationships. I pray that you help our relationships to be restored. 
friendships will be healthier. Parent-child relationships will be healthier. Marriages will be healthier, God. You're so good, Lord. So we trust in you. We're asking you to move in a mighty way. And we give you all the glory. And we pray this in your name. Amen.